Matt Jarvis, I am the Chair of the Division of Politics, Administration, and Justice. I am pleased to welcome Cal State Fullerton's President, Fram Virgie, to the podium. Since 2018, he has elevated the profile and reputation of Cal State Fullerton, and we are thankful for his commitment to a variety of campus programs, including, including the Royce International Symposium. President Virgie. Boy, that's, that's the fastest quieting I've ever seen of this group. I don't know how you did that, Matt. That's pretty good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you uh, for that uh, introduction. And um, I love being here uh, interacting with Titan alums, um, especially Titan alums that have literally transformed the world. And that's what we have, Ed. You exemplify that in so many ways. Uh, you are the definition of a world changer. Here we are just sitting uh, talking and we're talking about Africa and then I turn and we're talking about Ukraine and all the things we're going to be uh, having the panels talk about. It is exactly uh, what you are the essence of for, for not just for Cal State Fullerton, but for the country and for the, for the world. I really am so proud of our continuing partnership with you and Cal State Fullerton loves being on this journey with you. Folks, you know this, Ed, Ed Royce is a remarkable uh, person. Uh, he is a member of our 325,000 alumni at Cal State Fullerton. His accomplishments have enabled us all to be better connected uh, as a Titan family, uh, nationally and globally. And so when we say it takes a Titan, and we say that often, uh, Ed Royce is exactly the kind of Titan it takes. Uh, well, I'm sure much has changed since Ed was at Cal State Fullerton uh, when it was a sleepy commuter school um, in equally sleepy Orange County. Um, I'm also quite sure that a few of the core principles have remained true. For the last six decades, Cal State Fullerton um, it has continued to demonstrate a titan-sized commitment to graduating engaged and informed citizens engaged and informed citizens, citizens who then can make a difference, make a difference in their local community, in the state, in the nation, and in the world. And as the largest campus in the CSU system, um, and the only one in Orange County, uh, we know that we have a responsibility uh, to the community and to the region. We want our graduates to uh, use the foundational education uh, that they gain at Cal State Fullerton uh, to engage their pursuits and their passions uh, that we also provide to them, and then go out and change the world, make the world a better place. Uh, we're also committed to ensuring that all these education pathways are available uh, for all who aspire to that college degree, for all who aspire to not only raise themselves up, raise, but raise their families up and raise up their communities. And if it's, it is through that lens through which we um, seek to travel this journey, then I believe that we are on our way at Cal State Fullerton. Today, Cal State Fullerton is the home to 41,000 students. Uh, in fact, we're the largest undergraduate university in California. Uh, Orange County has the largest undergraduate university in California. And we were most recently recognized, yeah, absolutely. And we were most recently recognized as the third largest master's university in the nation. Now, bigger doesn't always mean better, but in this case, bigger means best. Uh, so, uh, in each of the past few years, we've received 80,000 applications for about 8,000 spots. It is a rigorous institution. We're cons consistently nationally ranked for both ac academic rigor and lowest net cost. Lowest net cost, 50% of our students graduate with no debt. And for the other half, for the half that have debt, that debt is about $15,000. Folks, that is thank you to the state of California more than anybody else that has a commitment to higher education. Uh, we are a transformative institution. More than 57% of our graduates are underrepresented students. They come from underserved communities. We're number one in California for graduating women. We're number three in the nation for graduating students of color. Nearly 60% of our students are first generation, first in their family ever to attend college. So we are a catalyst for change. 
nearly half of our students are Pell eligible students, and about half of our teachers and nurses and accountants and engineers in Orange County, they come from Cal State Fullerton. We produce them every year. We're a Hispanic serving institution and an Asian a Native American Pacific Islander in, uh, serving institution. And we are very, very proud of those um, designations. Um, some universities consider them just as a badge and a, a something to check off. But we are absolutely determined to serve those students, uh, to make sure that those designations mean something. Um, that's why we were only one of four universities last year in the same week to be named as an inaugural Fulbright Hispanic serving institution by the US State Department and to receive the seal of excellencia from excellency in education for serving Latinx students each year You can clap all you want. I'm, I'll always take that Each year we graduate about 12,000 students and this is, a, this is an incredible statistic. We have 325,000 alums and 80% of them live within 50 miles of our campus. So we are Orange County. We own Orange County. It is better in Orange County, sorry guys, to be a Titan than a Trojan or a Bruin or an Anteater or anything else as far as I'm concerned. And we continue to drive the Orange County economy as well. well for every dollar that we get the for the, from the state, we put about $13.50 back into the economy. And with alums like Ed, our reach extends beyond just Orange County or the state. It extends to the nation and internationally. And that's why I'm so, so very excited to be a part of the second, I love that we can say that already, the second Royce International Symposium. Um, the goal of this symposium is to advance academic research and campus-based community engagement on is issues of international significance. At Cal State Fullerton, we have a very strong commitment to be a place where our students, our faculty, our staff, and our community can uh, be prepared to engage in the world as global citizens. We have a long history at, 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 at the, in the Titan family of creating international agreements with more than 100 global uh, institutions of higher learning from all over the world. We have those students coming to us and we are sending our students out to them. We have our faculty going out to teach there and their faculty coming to teach us. And that is only expanding with post-pandemic hybrid classes and online education. We're looking at that more and more every day. Exposure to international academic programs through the study abroad program, uh, working and living and studying with students from across the world, it creates the environment that will build the global community that we want to build. We offer our students and our faculty and our staff a rare opportunity to interact in this world as it expands. So with our campus objective of embracing education through diversity and, in, and, and, and inclusive and an inclusive world, uh, we have grad students that are global citizens and we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be part of this event. So to the students that were here, and I know we had a couple of students stand up, I'm so proud that you're here. Thank you for being here. Just listen. You are gonna get so much out of this event. I'm so glad you're here, thank you. You will not regret it, I promise you that. To the rest of our guests, thank you as well for being here too. Um, thank you to the Nixon Library, of course, a great partner with Cal State Fullerton for sponsoring the event today. And then, of course, to our keynote speaker, to Ed. Thank you for your continuing partnership with your alma mater. Um, you make us so proud uh, that you are part of the Titan family. You are a titan among titans. That's exactly who you are. And so it's my, inter, uh, my, my honor to introduce and invite one of the most distinguished alumnus that we have to the podium to provide commentary and uh, an overall trip around the world of what's going on in American foreign policy in this destabilized world that we have. We're gonna have a great panel after, but for now, please welcome me in, in, in welcoming Ed Royce. President uh, Vergy, thank you for those kind words. Thank you for your leadership at the university. And I have to also thank Cal State Fullerton to, for joining today uh, in helping put together this symposium. I, it's got a great theme, American foreign policy in a destabilized world. Uh, I, I want to thank the World Affairs Council also for your role in this and, of course, 
the Nixon Library. Orange County Forum is represented here. Thank you. Uh, and what I'd like to do is, is give a, an, an overview, and I, I think I've got to start with a Nixon story because of where we are. So uh, we'll, I, I'll do that. Uh, and uh, then maybe get to questions and answers with you. But uh, to start with some of Nixon's observations, uh, I was elected in 92, so I remember, oh, before I do that, it's St. Patrick's Day. And I have to introduce somebody here because we met on St. Patrick's Day. That's my wife, Marie, who also happens to be the, the former Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Educational and Cultural Affairs. So thank you for being here with us today. Um, the, the observation I make when I got to D.C., the, one of the first things we did in 93, Richard Nixon wanted to address the House of Representatives. Now, this would be his last, his last address to the Congress. But when it was over, uh, he, he noticed me and he said, uh, Royce, you've got my old district. And he, he started, uh, he already knew I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee, which surprised me. And so what he said was, I have a, an opportunity to talk to the Senate, and I, I would like you to come along uh, and hear my observations. Uh, and then he went back to pressing me on how you have to be engaged on foreign affairs to really know what's going on in the world. So in those remarks, what was notable to me was this is the first time uh, I had seen Nixon sort of go around the world, but he, he had started with China. Opening up to China was his legacy. But the interesting part of his presentation was that second thoughts were already starting to form. And, and this was his point. He said, you know, I think Russia is destined to always be dysfunctional. But he said, Beijing, on the other hand, you know, there's, there's a great opportunity here. Like Europe, like Japan, they, we may change them by opening up um, the, the democratic ideals, you know, and rights that we think that they will adopt could make a huge impact on the future for stability. But on the other hand, the subservience to authority in a society which has a long history of authoritarian systems, if you were to combine that with state capitalism, this could be a real challenge. It could be a real challenge because of the power that China would have. We have to be engaged, I remember him saying. We have to um, try to have this impact. But his point was the jury is out in terms of how this will develop. And I think back to the lessons that Richard Nixon probably learned back when he was in law school. His, over here in La Habra was his office, his law office. And um, in 1939, he would have been in that office uh, representing this, this area. Uh, not yet representing this area, but working in this area, and reading the paper. And I'll, I'll show you the map that he would have seen at that time if this comes up. This would be, this would be the pacts or agreements which at the time were being made between Hitler and Stalin, uh, as well as the tripartite pact with Japan and the Pact of Steel uh, with Italy. And each of these agreements, just to explain what was happening that year, in September of that year, the agreement between Hitler and Stalin was to have Stalin invade Finland, take the eastern half of Poland, take the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, take eastern Romania, have Hitler take Western Europe and have all of Southern Europe, the Mediterranean area, that was to go to Mussolini, who um, under the Pact of Steel uh, uh, took over uh, 
Albania attacked Greece, took the, was in the process of taking the islands in the, uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, in Africa, in East Africa, defeated Ethiopia and Somalia. North Africa took Libya. They had this mapped out. And of course, in Japan, all of East Asia, all the island chain, uh, ultimately, it doesn't show in that map, but ultimately, the coast of Australia was attacked over a hundred times by bombers. The cities all along the north as the ships were being sunk in the east. This was the world which on September 1st, 1939, suddenly confronted the world. And there was a decision to be made by policymakers in Washington. And that decision was watching what had unfolded, was unfolding with four totalitarian powers. Would we send aid, munitions, to Britain, because the United Kingdom was standing alone at that time. The decision was made by President Roosevelt as well as, you know, by, um, by the a majority of the Senate to, through Lend-Lease, send 50 of our U.S. destroyers to replace those who had been sunk by German U-boats. The purpose was to keep the food and fuel coming into Britain so that Britain could continue the fight. And the decision was made to transfer fighter planes in order to intercept the bombers that were nightly flying over London during the Blitz. And this was effective in keeping these sea lanes all open. What was not known by the United States was that, that at that time, von Rippentrop, who had done the these very agreements with Molotov and, uh, and, of course, with El Duce, with Mussolini, he was at that time carrying out negotiations with the Japanese, urging them to attack the United States and be part of expanding this pact. And Tojo jumped the gun. He jumped the gun on December 7th. And before Hitler had consolidated his gains, because Hitler had some months prior, six months prior, decided to renege on his agreement with Stalin and to try to seize Moscow and Leningrad quickly. That did not happen. I'm just going through what was learned through all of this or should be learned by policymakers. That did not happen. Uh, because of the winter, the severity of the Russian winter, and because of um, General Zhukov and his troops. They stopped them. But in Pearl Harbor, we lost our fleet, and Hitler had not consolidated his gains. He declared war on us before we did on him. Uh, but as a consequence of this, it brought the United States into the war. The reason I walk through this is because for the presidents that lived through this war as young men, such as Nixon and John F. Kennedy, um, they had an opportunity to observe lifelong lessons of what happens when authoritarian, or in this case, totalitarian governments that are militantly so, are on the march and begin to carve up territory and do not have any respect for the democratic states that they are rolling over, because that was the early discussion. Let's take out the democracies. What they also learned was that the United States, when they saw a free people willing to fight back, might be wise to transfer those armaments or those destroyers because as the number of allies of free states are diminished, as the number of democracies are eclipsed and replaced, you know, by authoritarian control, the security of our own people are eventually at risk. Um, the cost also. 50 million souls died in that war. Six million Jews 
among them, uh, millions of other innocents that were slaughtered, and then whole armies that were ground up across North Africa and Europe and Asia. Let me go to the next map that I'd like to just focus on. Not long ago, an agreement was made, an alliance without limits between Russia and China. And again, my concern here is what is transpiring in the rhetoric coming out of Beijing and the actions of what they've done in the South China Sea. Uh, the fact that the, the atolls and the, right up to the, basically the borders of their neighbors in the first island chain. China is militarizing those islands and expanding them, building air bases, all with offensive weaponry. Their rhetoric and actions against the Japanese, against the Philippines, against the Indonesians, especially against the Taiwanese. These are issues that normally states that want good relations with their neighbors do not engage in. But this has been very aggressive behavior. And uh, some nine days after this agreement was signed, Putin, of course, attacked again, in this case, trying to take Kyiv, trying to take all of Ukraine. And 20 days after that agreement, after that press conference, you had the rhetoric about attacks on Taiwan by Pre President Xi, or I should say his actual title is, uh, you know, uh, he's the chief of the Communist Party. I, it's, it's not a presidential position. It's a Leninist system in which he's appointed to that by the Politburo, by the Politburo or in this case, he's basically appointed himself. He's consolidated all power. Um, at, at, at moments like this, it behooves us to look at history and to think and maybe rethink what we should be doing in order to deepen our ties with our allies and create a credible deterrence. In the case of Taiwan, we should be transferring them every missile system. We should make a porcupine, as someone once said, out of that island. They, they should have the capability of launching a credible defense so that China is not tempted to do the unthinkable. And likewise, we should, in my opinion, if a free people in Ukraine are looking for ammunition, we should be sending it. I will share with you that the concerns the Ukrainians had are the same concerns that six nations in, in former Central Asia have. Um, when I had conversations with the current chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, he said his worry, and this goes back to the collapse of Afghanistan, but at the time he said, my worry is that the way in which we pulled out of Afghanistan, and he, he reminded me, President Trump wanted to pull out, and now President Biden is pulling out. The way we're doing that, we are going to be perceived as betraying the women of Afghanistan, but also our allies and partners who have suggested that France and Britain stay in Bagram and stay in the major cities because the Afghans are doing the fighting. Why pull out now? All of that will be called into question. I would suggest that at this point in time, when Europe is sending ammunition and armaments, we would want to do that as well. I would also make the strong point that we never want to see U.S. troops in Ukraine. At the same time, we also have to be prudent about the weapons that are sent. We do not intend to send weapons that can reach the Kremlin, that can reach Moscow. But we should send those defensive weapons 
that will serve to defend a free people in Ukraine. And uh, I'll share with you, in 2014, I took a delegation of four Republicans and four Democrats. We went as far east we, as we could go. We went in, into Dnipropetrovsk, which were Russian-speaking Ukrainians, with the presumption that, that there would be more than one opinion when we got there. What I can share with you is that in our discussions, these Eastern, these Russian-speaking Ukrainians were filling sandbags as fast as they could fill them, and they were asking us to send anti-tank weapons and, uh, you know, artillery and so forth, and, and you know, something that they could use, anti-aircraft weaponry. Um, and, and even the one fellow I was able to find who represented the other side whispered to me when we went out, when the delegation went out, meeting, at the end of the day, we've got to figure out how we get the Russians out of here. That was a surprise to me. Um, we passed my bill in 2014 uh, to authorize then-President Obama to use that authority. That was not used then. That was not used under the Trump administration. That was not used under the Biden administration until basically right after the, the attack. I do think, again, that this issue of Putting forward credible deterrence is important. We can get into this in questions and answers. I wanted to make a few more points here very quickly. One is historically, this is the Han Empire. This would be, you'll see the Roman Empire to the west. This is sort of the high wa uh, watermark for China at the time. But for the Han people, there is a narrative. They have their narrative in terms of how they see history. And as you can see, the expanse of China, with its many uh, tributary states over the years who, who recognized uh, the leadership of sovereignty and paid tribute, it is a long list of countries. This is, uh, again, from the perspective of the narrative which the Chinese people study. This is the trip uh, taken by Admiral Zhuang. Uh, Zheng He's fleet, his fourth voyage, but you get a sense of Chinese power because this was a fleet of 300 ships. You can see they were 400 feet long. The three ships in Columbus's navy, uh, or in his uh, squadron, I should say, uh, you know, the, the biggest was 85 feet long. And that transported a force to the New World of, um, what, what does it say up there, how many men on those ships? 90 sailors. That's to be contrast, contrasted with 28,000 sailors. And, you know, this is both, both trips in the, 14, in, in the 1400s. It gives you a sense of that perspective that the Chinese have about their history and dominance over the region. Now we go to the built and road today. And here you can see both the, um, the built and the road. Yeah, you can see uh, all of the ports, uh, 50 of them, uh, that China has built or is building. The, in, in dark blue are the ports and the light blue are the ones they're building. You see in Australia what has become a real issue. China's built three ports there. And that's a domestic issue now because of the concerns of the belligerent way in which China's behaving. And they're not going to get the ports back for another 90 years. Uh, I'd like to go to another point. Maybe my final point before we go to questions and answers. And that is I, I made many trips as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, but one of them uh, was to Africa with uh, Secretary Colin Powell. And his great concern during that trip uh, was what was happening, what he was being told by leaders in China, and, and that leaders in Africa who were telling him what Chinese ministers were telling them. And he said the pitch was as follows. It was... You know, in China, we have a much better system. And our system, all the power 
is concentrated. And we think in your country it should be you. And we do not think you should have another election here. We would like to have our security people help you. Uh, in exchange, there are a few prerequisites that we think you really ought to implement. One of those is freedom of the press needs to go. We have our Chinese television that we'll bring in here, and we'll do that you know, in English or French or whatever. But uh, freedom of the press, you don't need that. You also, in terms of the court system, do away with the independent courts. You do not want to have that system. And um, lastly, we'd like to source your raw materials over to China. Now, in many cases, this meant taking apart the processing or smeltering plants or whatever that were done in, in Africa and moving that to China. Well, that meant that you know, the value added would be in China instead, and certainly the employment would be in China. This is another point that Powell made to me. You have hundreds of thousands of Chinese who are being brought over as laborers instead of integrating their workforce in these projects. And on top of it, the main challenge is that they're attaching these assets with usurious interest rates. This is loan sharking. So our Secretary of State was focused on an issue which we have now learned all a lot about since. But in learning about this, we have to deploy an effective competition to it. We now have the, de the Development Finance Corporation, the International Development Finance Corporation, which we passed out of committee, which allows us to underwrite and compete directly with the money that comes from Beijing. But we have to be attentive to this. We have the ability. We're now introducing 5G across Africa to compete directly with Huawei. But one of the great advantages is that people trust the 5G system. Uh, I don't need to belabor these points. I think a lot of you are aware of the challenges ahead. But I think the next generation needs to think long and hard about the lessons that John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon learned during that generation. And I think we should not necessarily assume then that when nations behave belligerently, um, I see Tom Sheehy here, one of the things he told me once was how a nation treats its own people can tell you a lot about how it is likely to treat its neighbors. And one last takeaway. From Pericles to Abraham Lincoln, there was a theme from democratic Athens on through into this country. Pericles' speech to the Athenians, Lincoln borrowed from that for the, basically the outline for his Gettysburg Address. The idea of the autonomy of a free people, the ideal of making everyone free, this has been a long, slow, clumsy, embarrassing climb, uh, climb for humanity, given the doctrine. But at least we have pushed that doctrine and we hold it up as our goal and we try to repair to it. And to know that through history, there are those who are authoritarian-minded, who have the opposite doctrine, one of dictatorship, one of the fatal conceit that a Joe Stalin or an Adolf Hitler can know better than everybody in their society and has the right to make every decision for the men and women in that, in that society. I would suggest the last point I'd make here, we can learn a chapter from Ronald Reagan's playbook. We need to get back to Radio Free Asia, uh, Asia Radio Free Liberty, Radio Free Europe, and we need to broadcast across the world, including in Africa and South America, and give civil society a platform and give fair reporting a platform to tell people what's actually happening. Because if we don't do this, the disinformation is going to continue to compound. With that, um, do I have time to open up for some questions, Owen? Yes. Okay, thank you.
I'm, I'm Phil Donahue, so. Who's got a question? Okay, just a second. I'm gonna get my exercise today. I ate the dessert, so. No, no I get to hold it. Ed, great to see you. Question I have, uh, you didn't mention North Korea and what's evolved with North Korea and how you see that playing into what you just discussed. I, I just didn't mention it because they haven't made any formal agreements. I mean, they, they send artillery and sell it to Africa, uh, to, uh, excuse me, they, they sell it obviously to Russia to be used, but um, as weaponry, but they're not in the same category as Iran which is actually now building factories in Russia to make these suicide drones and have transferred all these suicide drones. Uh, the agreements that, that Iran is making with China and with Russia really make them a junior partner, maybe in the sense that Mussolini was a junior partner. Uh, and so uh, I put them in that category. Uh, the North Koreans, still uh, aren't bound by any treaty. Uh, and so that's why I didn't uh, really cover them. Um, but you're right, they're, they're also a, a tremendous challenge. Yes, oh, gentlemen. I've, I've got a question over here, just a second. Yes. Hi, Ed. Uh, you know, you, you show in the prior uh, the slide. Yeah. The areas that China is currently already operating ports. Right. But I'm glad that you put this one for two reasons. One, right. as of January 1st of 2023, China combined you know, with the Asian countries and became a new organization. And now they are the main, ex this organization is the main exporter now to, the, yeah. to, the, to, to China, not to the United States anymore. And then the, China is also constru constructing all kinds of ports in Latin America. Yes. What and is I, the, oh, go yeah. ahead. No, no, go ahead. What is the reason that we as a country are allowing all of this to happen, including all 90% of the uh, countries from Mexico to Argentina are going socialist now? Why well, are we allowing that? Well, <laughs> because, because they're voting that way. This is the problem. And I addressed the parliament, the new par parliament in Colombia when they, you know, made the decision. I mean, the, the, the people of Colombia elected uh, the former head of um, one of the terrorist organizations that had blown up their Supreme Court there and killed a number of their judges. For many years, Colombia, you know, was solidly a democratically governed country. The new incoming president obviously wants to change that constitution. I got an invitation to go down and speak last year to their, their parliament, and I laid out for them uh, the obvious as well as an anti-corruption message, message because, unfortunately, these, many of these countries, as they head out in this direction, it's Chinese corruption that makes this a lot easier. They play by a different set of rules. We in Europe enforce rules that do not allow this kind of corruption, including bribing government officials. But you know something about what's happened in Argentina with the former president. She's now vice president again, right? I mean, these things are inexplicable that, these, that people with that kind of a record would get back into office. But ultimately, these are decisions that have to be made. And the Chinese are operating television stations and messaging on a constant basis. What I'm saying is we have to get back to what Reagan did well, and we have to use the tools now that we've given policymakers and industry to use, frankly, the International you know, Development Finance Corporation and get out there and compete because that puts it on an even playing field, and we're trying to do that. Okay, we have a question over here. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, Richard Downey from the World Affairs Council, and wonderful presentation. And I, I, let me first say, uh, your analogy of the past and, so, and the reasons for why we should support uh, Ukraine today are very effective, so thank you very much for that. Uh, my question is actually along the same lines with China. And for, as, as you mentioned, China 
uh, is now increasing its trade uh, throughout the world. Many of the countries in our own region, the largest trading partner is, is, is China. And, and in, many, in many cases, it's not because they really want to, ch to have trade with China, but because it's so attractive for the a couple of the reasons you've mentioned. Uh, there, Brazil, for example, uh, under President Bolsonaro, didn't want to have that, but they still, just because of the attractiveness, are now, that is now the uh, largest trading partner, China is. So uh, those tools that you mentioned, you know, most of what we have done now to kind of counteract that effect is basically just to warn countries that you really don't want to be uh, in this integrated relationship with China, uh, you know, because it's, it's a warning as opposed to doing something effective. What are those tools that we could do, make things more attractive to these countries who really don't want to work to, with China but want to work with us, but to make it very pragmatic for them to work with us? It's, it's a list of things that, frankly, are going to take... Uh, there's a new law that was passed by um, Mike McCall, who's now chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, but he, he has a provision that's, that now directs our Foreign Service to basically be a commercial service. Everybody becomes a commercial service officer. Every single person in that embassy begins to do this. That is one step. The second step is although we've vastly expanded the capabilities with the DFC, there's an equity fix, fix that would allow us to do more and expand it more. The next point is that we have to put leverage on our allies. We are seeing this now in terms of their opposition on Huawei of rip out and replace, right? You see Europe doing that. Uh, I see it right now in, in Africa in terms of uh, the competition now against Huawei. The next thing you're going to see is, especially with the result of uh, Michael Gallagher chairing, you know, this select committee on China, you're seeing prescriptions come out of that committee and out of McCall's committee. Uh, we're not going to use, do dual-use investment into China, and we're going to begin to enforce the rules of the road, and I would suggest we need to enforce the same rules. Don't let China play by one set of rules and we play by another. It needs to be the same set of rules, and that, that's the bottom line, and I think you're going to see a lot of legislation come out of the House of Representatives and into the Senate to force these points. Ed, we've got uh, time for two more questions, one here and one over there, and then we've got to get to the panel, so yes. um, here. Hello, Mr. Royce. My name is Lavanya. I'm a student at Fullerton, and my question was that you, as a person who recognizes international relations and patterns, do you think that we, as a sovereign state, um, are entering an age of decolonization or colonization overall? Thank you. Well, that's an interesting question, because I think that the goal should be decolonization the practical implication of both the attack directly, uh, you know, that we see uh, against Ukraine, as well as what we see in Africa, leads me to believe that we're looking at an unfolding colonization. And I referenced Secretary Powell's concerns about what he had seen, you know, in terms of um, bringing in workers without employing the locals. And uh, I, I just think it very much looks like the European colonization of, of Africa uh, in terms of not playing by a set of rules at all and certainly not respecting the local uh, rules or wishes of the local population. To cut a deal with a head of state is different than having the buy-in of people. That's why democracy is the best antidote of this, so that people can have their voices heard in protest about conditions like this. Another last question. Final, final question here. Sir Tom Rendell, I'm a, an independent military analyst, but uh, General MacArthur, reported by President Kennedy, actually told him anyone who would engage in a land war in Asia ought to have their head examined. 
but that would mean to wish to engage. We are actually practicing those things now, and, and we are not ahead in the game, but we have a long way to go. Now, wait a minute, wait, seems a minute. wait a minute. Where are we engaged in, in by, by MacArthur's definition yep. in a land war in Asia? We are not, but we right. are engaged in a process that could lead to that. So what I'm saying is the military is preparing for the eventuality, because if you don't prepare, going back to what exists from ancient Roman times, if you, if you want to avoid war, or if you want peace, prepare for war. But my main point would be, um, what would you think about reestablishing the U.S. Information Agency? Because much of what we need to do is public diplomacy related. I think it's an A-plus suggestion, okay. because it would be done correctly. And I just would, would add this. Remember, you cannot do any of this without allies, nor should you. So the point is that when Japan is talking to India, and India is talking to Australia, and... South Korea is paying attention, and the, and the Philippines is talking again to the United States, and all of them are saying, we don't want to be aggressive, but we want a defensive relationship to make certain that we are able to keep the peace. I, I think a land war in Asia is not what we want, but a credible deterrence in Asia where we have our allies stationed there and we are transferring to them the weaponry is the first order of business right now in terms of that credible deterrence. Thank you, sir. And we've Thank got you. one last, oh, last sure. question, okay? And it's supposed to be short. Okay. I, I don't know. As long as it's not about Afghanistan. I am kidding you, Hassan Nuri. Go <laughs> ahead. Ask the question. I'm sorry. You mentioned all the good things about Ronald Reagan. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yes. It was unyielding policies of Ronald Reagan, supported by young, brilliant people like you, that broke the back of the system of communism and disintegrated the Soviet Union. My proposal to you is to become a candidate for the presidency of the United States. Oh. <laughs> I wish you would have asked about Afghanistan. I just, I, no, I. My Shermanesque statement is, Hassan, even if you run my campaign and I was elected, I would not serve. I just want you, to be Shermanesque about this. You heard it here first. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you all very much uh, for your engagement here.